Anyway, if you don't know me, I'm Jill Heemster. I'm in, uh, in Nebraska. I work a lot with uh, the Livestock and Poultry Environmental Learning Center, and coordinating that is my main job. And so I spend a lot of time playing in the online world. And I found, uh, I stumbled across some cool things and I thought it would be fun to share. And so using augmented reality for something like a poster, a publication, or we're going to get into virtual tours towards the end, but there I have a really hard time separating augmented reality and virtual reality. Does anybody have Google Translate on their phone? So what would that say? Have you seen what Google Trans have you guys used Google Translate? tried and tried to get it to say waste to worth, but it says waste to value. Oh, is that what it says? Oh. Welcome to waste to value, <laughs> is what that says. <laughs> but, uh, so yeah, Google Translate's essentially an augmented reality app. Um, and I happen to have the Spanish database downloaded for mine. I, there's all sorts of other um, languages you can download, and you don't even need the internet for it to work if you have it downloaded. So. Next time you're traveling, Google Translate. Get the menu out, you know, look over the menu, that kind of stuff. Anybody else need to do this yet? Okay. So, augmented reality is, virtual reality is basically, it's completely immersive. You put on the glasses, you're completely in the, the make-believe world or the, the technical world. Augmented reality is growing a lot faster right now. Virtual reality seems to have stalled a little bit, and that's funny to say because you read all these articles about it growing. But augmented reality is basically being in the physical world but having a layer between you and having a layer of technology. Yeah. <laughs> and so there's a lot of really cool applications, I think, for, for extension in this. Um, so if you can imagine something like what you just saw on the screen, what, what sorts of things could you envision an extension possibly that we could do? What's the old standby that extension is known for? Publication. Yeah. Yeah. All kinds of things. So there's a lot of uh, interactive print applications that work, um, online publications, you can embed 3D types of things in there, and then virtual tours will be what we talk about towards the end. So one of the uh, cool things is, for example, you saw how it translated for you, and you, how many of you know what QR codes are? Okay, so imagine that <coughs> a picture on one of your publications could be scanned in the same way and you play a video or an audio file that explains or maybe it animates what you're showing. Those are the kinds of things that augmented reality can do. So here's the, some of the apps. I've been playing with Erasma a lot, um, mostly because you can have a free account but in order for anybody to see what you create, they have to be following you. So if you don't, if you have the Erasma app on your phone, follow the LPELC channel, and it's all capital, and you'll be able to see the couple of things that I did here. If you don't, we'll just hand this around too. Um, Layer is the one that is the most powerful. It's got some much cooler features than Erasma, but I haven't graduated to where I'm paying for uh, an account yet. Basically, you pay by the page. So if you create a page with something, something like three dollars a page or something like that for the 
for the material so that might be something we'd look into an institutional account of maybe your community i'd be really surprised if your communications people at your universities don't have some of these already especially layer the professionals so they might be willing to experiment with you on that and blipper is another one that does similar things i haven't played with that one but i just wanted to put it up there those are some apps that you can you can explore um, and they're both android and ios so they work with with both systems all right so what i originally was going to do is Leslie was presenting a poster tonight, and her poster's about lagoon, uh, closing the lagoon at the research farm where, she, where, uh, where I used to work and where she is now. And there's some cool drone footage flying above while they're clearing out the, the lagoon. Well, we had an adventure last night where when we came back to lay her poster out, we realized it was no longer in the room. Housekeeping <laughs> mistook it for garbage. In the, it was because it was still in the tube. And so, long story short, she didn't get back with her new poster till very late. So I, I, I did it on here instead. So if you do have Erasma and are following LPELC, you can get out this little thing that was on the tables this morning and scan this. But otherwise, go ahead and you come on up here if you want, and we'll I'll show you what this does. <clears throat> yeah, you have to get up. Sorry. <laughs> so come see this. Erasma is another app. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, so here I have um, Erasmus on my phone. It's just a little kind of a purple triangle on here, just Erasmus. Mm -hmm. And so when I open it, now see, if I was using best practices, I would actually make it very clear on this that scan this with Erasmus, follow the LPELC channel and see a cool video. But since our, this is plan B, it didn't work out <laughs> that way. So, see if it gets it there. So it's playing the, and there is no sound with the drone footage. So it's actually playing what we would have hoped to play over Leslie's poster, actually showing the, the excavator. But it goes away if you move. Yep. Uh, so you have to stand, you can't take a picture of it and then step away and, and watch mm -hmm. it. No. And the other thing that I, I don't like about this is that I would love to just go to like a YouTube video, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. and you have yeah. to actually upload the video to Erasmus. Mm -hmm. They have some size limits, so you have to be kind of careful yeah, with that. that. Mm -hmm. So those are some things that are still, I think Layer might be more robust in its ability to do things like that. Yeah, so it's kind of challenging to kind of even I know. focus on them. Yeah, and if you mm -hmm. wanted to come back to it at another time today, yeah. you'd have to have the paper. Mm -hmm. Yep, you'd, you'd have to have that paper. So. Mm -hmm. um, so like tonight, if we had been able to do this, you'd be able to walk up to a couple spots on Leslie's poster and actually see a presentation about the lagoon, the, the oh, lagoon being crazy. closed and some of the research on it. So these were the, these are the sorts of things that we're going to probably start trying to integrate whenever I do my next poster. It'll have some of this sort of, we have some, and this works on a screen too. When I have this image up on my computer screen, I can do it, but it's kind of defeating the purpose. <laughs> so. Um, but it'd be like uh, if you did a workshop and you had different stations, someone could go up and actually. Yeah. And there's more. So anybody wanted to try it? Actually, mm -hmm. scan it. Mm -hmm. You are welcome to do that yeah, here. If anybody I, wants to I do just it. downloaded it. I did too. <laughs> <laughs> she told us to. <laughs> I bet okay, it's one so of those things too. Is if, if more people are using okay. it, YouTube will buy it yeah, or something, and you'll be able yeah. to do it in the future. Somewhere here it'll let you. Creek connection. Oh, there's that little thing right there. Yep. I didn't see that because I was there for it. I just wanted to see what they were sharing. Yeah. yeah. Is there something? Uh, it might be the shadow. Mm -hmm. If you came around this way, you either put it all in shadow or. Sorry, you're following the channel. Or did you just download the rest? Oh, yeah. <laughs> So that's so that so if I paid for my Erasmus account, so then you have to like then follow, you could like in yep, here. So find um so hmm, okay, yes, huh? yeah, no, it have to be all capital. I know <laughs> that threw me off too the first time. Okay, so now the point being, this has to be very specific. Yeah, that's the problem with the free account. You know, if I were to pony up and pay, it would be different. 
So did it not bring it up for you? Yeah, you are. Oh, well, I have to pick. Yeah, cool. what do I do? So let's try it down and let's see if many steps. Uh, let's try it again. Maybe I just didn't like the shadows. So let's pull this out. Oh, yeah. Okay. Okay. It doesn't do anything. It just goes back to the right. Uh, maybe you can use it. Maybe you don't allow your camera to be shared or something. We can try it afterwards. We can do it. Yeah. We'll, we'll actually go through the steps to create this at the end. Oh, well, that's true. Well, I can do it now. Why not? We're, we're thinking about it. This is supposed to be interactive. Um, all right, so. So if I go into Erasma, um, hopefully the Wi Fi is chugging along. Jill, do you, have, do you have to follow every part of the LTLC thing? Nope, just the channel. And oh, that's the public aura? Mm hmm. Yep. Okay. All right, so I get in here, and I can go to my auras. <laughs> I just love how they name these. So here's the one we were trying to do with Leslie's poster, but it wasn't a good enough. And this is this is a good example to show is that really colorful image, and Amy recognizes that pretty well too. Um, I was just scanning that from her, a smaller version of her poster, and when I tried to create an aura with it, it told me, no, this image isn't good enough. So it's pretty good about telling you if it doesn't think that people are going to be able to scan that. And I, I went ahead and did it anyway and tried, and no, nope, it didn't work. So so that was the um, one of the things we learned. But So over here, you can create a new aura. And so basically, you the image that I had on here, this little word cloud, is what we call the trigger image. And so it's telling me to upload a trigger image. So what do I want them to scan in order to see this interactive content I'm showing them. So we'll see what's in my pictures. This could be an interesting adventure in um, what's in Jill's pictures folder. <laughs> All right, so my trigger image, I'm going to upload something from a file, browse, and let's see. So I just pick a pick an image. Uh, let's see. Yeah, my son with his braces, he'd love that, wouldn't he? <laughs> let's try the waste we'll just do the waste to worth logo. All right, so I've got this up here. So I could create something where the slideshow that Leslie is doing right now with all the pictures people are, are texting in, I could set it up so that that's what comes up when I do this. But right now I'll just pick that, probably that same short little video because it's a nice short clip that won't make the Wi-Fi crash. And so I've kind of got it the way. Oh, ask me again. Don't show this message again. Whatever option said don't show this message again, that's the default, right? Okay, so then next. And then it's asking me to upload the overlay. And so that's what's going to appear when, they, when somebody scans the image. So I'll go in here and take a look. I don't know if I've got the... I think I deleted the... Um, Oh, here's a, this is a nice short video. So I just upload the video, and again, I really wish it would let me do like to YouTube or even just to open a web page would be nice, but I think those capabilities are in layer. They're not, they wouldn't be in, in Erasma. 
And so here I can change it around if I want it to completely cover the Waste to Worth logo or if I just want it to appear kind of off to one side. Um, you know, I can move that around as I kind of see fit here. And then I would tell it next, name it um, W2W Workshop. Um, logo. I can give it hashtags if I was actually wanting people to find this, if it wasn't just a demonstration, but I'll just do this for now, or I'll do, and then I save it, take a look in my auras. It's kind of a search thing. Like if people actually open uh, Erasma. No, it's just if they're actually open Erasma and they want to find cool things. Yeah, right. So they if they're like, oh, let's see if Waste to Worth has something up here. <laughs> they would do that. Okay. Don't want to just. Okay, so we'll close. There, my auras did it. So I've been having trouble with it not, oh, there, it is, and it's a private one. I've been having trouble with it. It says that it's shared, but it isn't when I save it. So I always end up having to open it a second time and make sure that it's shared. So that's one of the little goofy things on this. Okay, so now it's public. And so if you were to scan I don't know if this little Waste to Worth logo is big enough or not, but essentially, let's see, if I scan it on my phone here, hopefully it comes up. Nope, it's not happy at the moment, but theoretically, you should be able to scan that Waste to Worth logo, and then that little animation will pop up. So that's how long it takes to create one of these. One of the things, oh, perfect. Perfect, got it. I heard somebody playing it over <laughs> somewhere. <laughs> but yeah, perfect. Yeah. Yeah, right up here, that would be... Got to try it now. It didn't work on my screen, so. My shadow's in the wrong spot. Oh, yep. Good play. So yeah, I could, the, when Leslie gets the video slideshow done, I could attach it to that or you know, however, whatever we thought would be a good representation of this. So obviously if you try to take like your university logo and do something like this with it, probably not the best idea. <laughs> you know, if you go to a farm site and want to use their like farm sign to do one of these, maybe that's not the best idea either, you know, because that might be their, their thing. Um, it would be cool, but so kind of choice in pictures. Right now it's the wild, wild west. Wait, so basically the first one that takes a picture of and does this for like Bucky Badger, then that's what's on there and they can have that be whatever. I don't know how it'll eventually be uh, be refereed, but I would think that somewhere along the way this is going to occur and that something will, will come up. But would you have to be following the person who developed that? Not if they actually paid for an account. See, like I'm, I'm being cheap. I'm a cheap extension person, so that's why you have to follow me to see these things. So if someone else did I don't think so. No. So, so it, like I said, it's kind of the wild, wild west at this point. Yeah. If you pay, could it be private? Right. So, like somebody scans that logo of the farm, but you would have registered unless you pay. All right. Like so, you have a network of people mm -hmm. that you said are okay, getting only these this subset. Of that's a good question. I'm not sure how. Because right now I can have it private, but that means nobody can scan it and see it. Or if I have it public, 
anybody that follows me can scan it. But as far as having different settings where maybe somebody has to have, yeah, there's a way to say only this, these people can do it. I suspect there will be something like that if there isn't already, but I haven't run across that. Can you limit people? On here? I don't know. I haven't actually looked to see if I could limit or if I could moderate following. Um, that would be a good, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. How did you choose these apps? Are there, are there more popular ones or is it the most, is it the most popular? Yeah, well, Erasma is used a fair bit and then it had the option to do these things and just play in it for free. That's why I'm using that one now. Layer is, I'm told, when you, when you graduate, <laughs> layers where you actually want to be producing content. Like if we were to begin production on, you know, posters or whatnot, layers where you'd actually want to be doing things and there's just a little cost with that. Um, I said, I thought they told me it was like $3 for a page, but I don't know for sure. Um, I haven't verified that. I have an account, but I've never gone into it to actually create anything. Um, so that was, so those are the two. And then like I said, Blipper is one that, right now it's a, I think it's geared a little more for kids in my mind, but I, so if you have a youth audience or something, that would be good. And I quite honestly don't even know about the free or paid version of that um, because I just haven't played in it as much, but it was popular enough that I put it on that list before. So those are three, they'll keep you busy for hours. You'll wonder where a day went with those. The next idea, and this one, I get to show somebody else's work. So, embedding a 3D graphic, so we get to go back here. All right, this is from Oregon State University. They had a, and if we get a chance, I might play that five minutes of video clip of Dennis actually talking about, or Alan actually talking about how this came about, but basically they had an, a new beetle that showed up in Oregon, and it looked similar to one that was already there. And so people were having a lot of issues telling a good one from the bad one. And so in their online publication, he created a 3D image showing the two side by side. So you can look and see what do they look like underneath, how do they look from the side, how would you, you know, tell these two beetles apart, which is which. Now obviously this doesn't work on the paper or printed version, but for an online publication, I thought this was a pretty cool, pretty cool thing to do. And the, the app that um, he did this in is called Sketchfab. And um, you, can, you can play in it for free. Obviously, there's options to pay anymore. A lot of these apps will have a free version, and then you have to pay to do the really cool stuff. So there's free that if you're an educational um, user, basically a .edu email address. There's some perks in there. Um, you can embed, obviously, a sketch fab you create in a website. You can actually just share that little 3D animation. Um, Oregon State shares it on their Facebook page all the time. They share it on their Twitter timeline every so often, just all by itself. And, um, and it's a universal player, so you don't actually have to download an app. It just plays right in your browser, right on your... Um, so, it, so you don't have to go through that whole thing that you guys had to do to get, scan my little word cloud there. This is just kind of a universal player. And then Augment's another app that um, works more in that 3D realm. And so those are two if you want to play with 3D types of things. I put Sketchfab up there um, on top just because some of the extension people I know that are doing this, that's where they're working first. But I think they're, both apps are thought pretty, pretty highly of. Uh, when you go from a, a simple face, something to this incredible 
know, possible. You learn how to do it, but also the audience. How, how do you make those decisions? Right. Yeah, if you're, if you're audience, um, David, who's your audience now? <laughs> Four age kids. Yeah. Um, high school. Yeah. For him, it's going to be a, a no-brainer to probably be looking into some of these because they're going to have the smartphone. They're going to have a lot of these apps already. Um, but if there's some real educational value, I think any more, even a lot of farmers, in my mind, skipped right over the computers. They went right to these things. And so they're happy to look at things. <laughs> I have them tell me, yeah, auto steer's awesome. I, I watch, they have TVs in the tractors now because they have nothing to do while they're planting or and they're actually looking at educational materials. And so as far as when we would go there, I think we can go there anytime. Because um, there are options here to, it's not terribly high cost, and being on the early edge of it, I would think that your university department, university communications folks would probably be looking for guinea pigs. So they might help you out there with some of the costs. It's something you can even build into, uh, if you need funding, a grant project, I would think you could build in some some, uh, some ways to cover that if you needed to justify that. But when it comes to you know educational and timely, uh, you know, it could be deployed pretty fast. If you have an older publication and you wanted to be able to add something to it, you could make it so that they could scan and get a video or something like that. Obviously, the print, existing print copies wouldn't have the instructions. But um, I don't know if I'm answering your question or not as far as going there. It's when you're ready to go there and when you think your audience has the technology. First, part of my question is what is the actual value of having multiple 3D versus having different views, static? Cool. Well, <laughs> cool is good, but I want to know what the cost is. What the, what the well, that cost. was free. That sketch that was free, but it was it was Dennis's time creating. That's that's. Mm -hmm. yeah, what what was his time creating? You know, I, I need to ask him that. I don't know how long it took him to do that. What did he What did he start from? Did he have like actual bills that he? That's his question. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. It might do. A, it might be. So what I've seen in other programs. Is that yeah. when you set it up and then you have a camera rotate around and take a bunch of pictures and then the program kind of interpolates in between the pictures to give you a view? Yeah, so there's hardware involved there. So you have yeah. to have to buy and, and so I don't know what the I don't know what the camera needs are for that. Like if there's a way to do it with them just like regular. Yeah, that might be something we need to do with your communication services. Mm -hmm. So yeah. you know, there's other so other kinds of things like Google SketchUp. Right. Right. Yep. And some of them create will create the three D for you out of a two D image. Right. But in the case of this beetle, that wouldn't necessarily do you all that much good because you need if the purpose of the three D model is to identify how does this beetle look different than that beetle, you don't want it automatically interpreting for you, you know, you'd actually want that. So I'm seeing what formats this, um, How would you use this in a number context? Like, do you have any good examples of how this is going to use? Is it, I don't know anybody in the manure yeah, world that's I using it. File, like, yep. Okay. I, looks like my <laughs> Wi-Fi is, is, uh, out here a little bit, but, um, let me pull up. Yeah. yeah, like in the, like in the work we're doing. Like, I'm just right. curious if anyone has seen yeah. anything. I just can't think of my mind. Like, uh, like if I just a small scale something yep. that you get around and you actually put around it small size and then over the top. Yeah. Yeah. Or around even more. Yeah. Or even to show oh, like a solid separator. Mm -hmm. and, and well, a lot of equipment you can't see. Uh, you can't see the whole piece of equipment when it's installed. So like when you take a picture of it, it kind of looks mm -hmm. like a black box. Yeah. And so if you could get in there as they're building it and take pictures, mm -hmm. and then show how they get those instead of mm -hmm. just like a black box. Cool, thank you.
Yes, I was going to say like a digester. I would love to have like a 3D image of that or even a compost pile. I would think, you know, go inside a compost pile. Like if you could show the layers and mm -hmm. like get inside of stuff. Because like when you take, to me that's, I use this stuff when I can't accurately show it with just a flat picture. Mm -hmm. So what are things that we want to dig into that you can't just see? Okay. So here is in, oops. Let me pull this over here quick onto my desktop. But this is um, Dennis sent me to this uh, webinar to pull a clip for you. Let me get the professional development director for ACE, which is the association. And don't worry, we're going to skip past this. And this is a webinar on 3D virtual reality hippographics presented by Alan Dennis. Who's a Alan Dennis, sorry, Dr. Dennis. Extension Experiment Station and I'm pulling on the wrong. Communications at Oregon State Home University. Um, to all create really cool interactive content. So besides 3D content and, and understand the nuances and the differences between, and if you go ahead and open 9143, and if you go ahead and open that up, it's going to be that's the document. So they're talking about the yeah, and I'm going to go ahead and, and share. Let's see. Share another um, window. Sorry, I had it marked as five minutes, but it's. Thank you. Let's be six. Isn't it scary when the tech people can't figure out <laughs> Adobe Connect? So um, this document that I'm about to share um, again is but something I don't think that. He tells um, us how he got the beetle image now. We, we thought there was a need for some 3D graphics here because these these insects, as you can see on the bottom side here, um, one of them is the invasive beetle that we're looking for and one of them is not, but they look very similar. Um, and so we wanted sort of a field guide that um, you could really interact with and, and understand the nuances and the differences between these beetles. So rather than just have these um, images down here at the bottom, we actually have an interactive 3D model here. And um, this is going to look pretty choppy through the, the webinar, um, but it's actually very smooth. And so I can actually click and drag. I can look at the bottom of the beetle, I can look at the top, and I can compare their sizes. Um, so this is a very, um, I would say this is still sort of a, a traditional um, deployment of 3D content. This is inside of a PDF. Um, if you print the PDF out, you're just going to get the, the initial image um, that, um, like the default view of these of these beetles. So there's nothing stopping you from just printing this out like a normal PDF. But if you do have it open up on a computer, you'll be able to see um, see these uh, beetles in, in 3D. So um, then I'd like to direct your attention. Um, over to the web links. And there's a, a website called Sketchfab. And um, Sketchfab, you can think of it as um, a, a YouTube of 3D content. So it's openly distributed 3D content um, that you can annotate very easily. So if I come back over here to my browser and, and show this to you. to Sketchfab. This is my personal Sketchfab page um, that I also use for some, some work content. So this is a, a more recent publication that is actually meant to be both an augmented reality and a virtual reality deployment. So when I say virtual reality, that's what, that's what we're looking at here. Um, we're viewing it on a computer. We can interact with it, but it's, it's, it's in its own um, it's in its own world. Um, it's not being overlaid on something in the real world. 
But as you can see here, this is actually designed as if it were um, on top of a physical printout. So this is, this is actually a physical printout, um, and it's Oregon's top 20 commodities. And if you receive one of these in the mail, um, you can use your cell phone and hold your cell phone up to this graphic. And these images will pop out of it. And that lets you do, do some really interesting things. So we can actually zoom in here onto each of these top commodities. And if we want to learn more about um, cattle and calves, here's, um, here's a couple of, of web links that we can click on, and we'll open them up. So we've got a, an OSU extension catalog link. We've also got one from the Department of Animal and Rangeland Sciences. And you can actually click through these sort of like a story. So I'm going from one to the next just by clicking on this um, navigation bar at the bottom. So the difference with the augmented reality deployment is that um, you're actually holding your you're holding your um, phone up to the document as if it were a window into a virtual world. So I have my phone, and there would be a there would be a document, and I'd be looking through it, and little interactive pieces would would show up on the on the screen of my phone, and you could click. Okay, and basically then he goes into talk a little bit more about augmented reality and virtual reality. But uh, but yeah, when I had asked him about this stuff, that was the clip he told me to, that would explain. But it's kind of, I thought it was kind of a neat deployment of the, uh, being able to click and see more of the publications and the links and move to the next commodity was a really interesting one too. And then he said to be sure to show you the 3D image before because it didn't come through on there. So we, we got to see that as well. All right, where did my PowerPoint go? Okay. So yeah, you can see that, uh, that he uses Sketchfab. Augment's another one that does that. And I, like I said, I will find out how they get the 3D content in there. Um, some other, here's where the virtual tours, and I, I begin to have sometimes too high of expectations of augmented reality, and I, I want it to be more like virtual reality in some cases. But I can totally see a research plot, you know, you could get the photo, um, you know, the 360 degree panoramic photo. You could capture something in a field day or a demonstration as far as taking that next next step into what what are some reasons why we would want to deploy this. Um, one thing that strikes me as far as why would we want to even have like a demonstration site that is in this virtual world? Well, what did we just recently have in the poultry industry that wiped out a lot of birds in the area? Influenza. Okay, all of you come to the research farm, <laughs> mingle, and go back to your farms. <laughs> so I could see potentially in a, in a biosecurity type situation, you, if you wanted to have a mortality composting demonstration, you could potentially do something like this where you, uh, you could have something they could see online or interactively and not have to physically come to a, a site. Uh, for, for even research, I think it would be great to see a time lapse of that site as the crops grew or, you know, oh, there was no nitrogen in this check strip or, you know, no manure application and here's the different rates and then you see a sequence of images throughout the summer showing the color of the crops that came out. And then there's a little blinking dot that you can click on and then maybe you, the PhD expert researcher, or maybe the poor schlub of a grad student that had to lay all this out, comes up talking about the, what you're seeing in the research or, or what the different uh, rates of manure were. So those were some, some cool things that I um, have begun to try to envision. Now one um, augmented reality type of virtual tour is Guidego. And that one um, uses location. Let me see if I can get, um, well, I guess I have it up here. I'll do it on the computer. 
and I think this is both Android and iOS. So guy to go. Okay, yeah, there's a couple of them here. This first one, um, Michelle Kroll at University of Missouri developed. <coughs> I was looking at this yesterday. Okay, so we'll do it in Chrome then. Make me do it the hard way. Fine. Oh, I forgot. I can't open. I can't close all of them. Sorry. You have to go through this again. A really cool blog if you're into blogs, if I do say so myself. <laughs> so here's um, Michelle Kroll at the University of Missouri created this, and her purpose in creating this tour was in her county there were eight farmers markets. And so she wanted to raise awareness on the farmers markets where they were. So this is a really um, it's a simple tour. There's nothing terribly fancy about it. Yep. And if I remember it, it doesn't really let me zoom like I want to. Well, I guess it does. But it's cooler on the on the phone here. But see, it would guide you to the first one. It tells you a little bit about it. And then on this one, there's one picture associated with this first one, which she uploaded. And you can go through. Over here is the next one, so you get to Farmer's Market 2, so on and so forth. So it's a, this is really basic. It's just showing location. It has a picture and some basic information on them. This next one that was made with guy to go is a little bit more complex. Yeah, and that's the one where I, I, I was like, oh, I wanted more when I saw it. Yeah. You know, and I think part of that's the free version versus... Um, it can't be like a virtual tour. Right, right. So it's where this one is Key West, looking at some... Welcome to historic Key West. Enjoy this 12-stop introduction to the largest historic district of frame buildings in the United States. Each location has an historic marker attached to the site with a short description of the property and a corresponding website at www.kwhmt.org. So it takes you through, you can see the sequence there. The Custom House and Historic Marker Number 71 is located at 281 Front Street. This impressive brick building is the Custom House Museum. And so with these, what I would love to do is to be able to walk up and actually have the site, you know, if I was actually at the site, to have that come into play where it's on my camera and you begin to see the pieces at the site. But this is basically what guy to go is as far as creating some virtual tours. So it has some possibilities, but I think there's there's a lot more that, that could be done in the future in if this. You were, if you had like a, something in the window expo, but some sort of large event that you, and maybe your education stuff is spread out on the make sure people knew where to get yep. there, you could do that type of tour. Yep. And you know, as you notice, some of these are over a larger area where the GPS is useful as they get smaller. Now, something the size of the Menorah Expo oh, might might be good enough. But like if I was some, trying to do something in this room, obviously you wouldn't need GPS, but it, it's not as fun. And so here's where I'm going to be um, 
talking about things I would like to try or like to see in virtual tours and this one I believe was done with well I guess I'll get to in just a second what these were done with but this was this past football season for Nebraska they had a company come in when Nebraska played oh yeah sorry I'm so used to just telling it and they came in and took a panorama of the entire stadium let's see I'm trying to see where I can make this full screen there's got to be a way oh no that's that's selling me something <laughs> so you can go around the whole stadium my tickets are there <laughs> but all those ends anybody want to know what those are tag. yeah people could tag themselves in this in this image they set it up so that people could tag and um, it, it's really surprising when you get in close you really can see <laughs> you can see people so I'm like yeah there's right there is is where I yeah I was the one in red <laughs> well I wasn't there that day it was the husband and the son were there so this was kind of a fun exercise and it takes um, if you put a you can they did this with a fisheye lens and they had a special panorama mount on the tripod not just rotating the tripod is apparently not good enough in this there's a special panorama mount with this fisheye and they went around and if you look let me see I don't know if, if it shows up very well but yesterday it was showing up really well for me okay not so much here there's actually seams in this I was finding different seams where they had it had stitched it together from the you know the view the camera had to getting it on here so does it play the entry video Oh, the scoreboard. The tunnel walk, isn't it? <laughs> Dear Lord, bad we go through life. All right. We ask for. So. So you could almost like just iPhones, for instance, do really good big panoramas. So it's not like this. With that addition, you could do like a farm panorama with click on. Yep. Play the video for this, or learn more about the, you know the manure storage. Learn more about why we store our manure, you know, or things like that. So obviously, right now it's people like athletic departments that are doing some of these things. So that's why I showed it to you. I can find it. <laughs> they have the money. <laughs> but the but yeah the I don't know what they spent to do this but the you know a fisheye lens for a camera isn't that bad and even I don't know if a regular panorama just from like you said the iPhone mode would do it but they they obviously did it up well enough that people could tag themselves in this one and then um, this was done I believe this is the same software that did that Husker one okay yep and so here's a here's another virtual tour so you can go in you can look around and then you look for places to click oh here's where I go next and you get this mm -hmm. I, I believe so I think if I would have had this up on my phone. And so this one, um, I'll have to close this one or at least mute it. Is there with 3D goggles that they're doing now? This one, I'm not sure if this one, I think there are some where if you put on the virtual reality goggles that you might get a different view than AR, but right now they seem to be kind of separate. Which, which is this? So, I'm pretty sure the that the Petra one was Panatour, and that's like a software you buy. 
and it was in euros. <laughs> so like the regular one was like 99 euros or something like that, and I think the professional version was twice that somehow. So it's not a terrible, horrible price for a computer program. And it and it's uh, and as I did looked at virtual tours, right now this seems to be the leader in the clubhouse as far as doing things like that. And I think that that Husker football um, panorama was made through this software too. I, I'm not 100% sure of that, but I'm I'm reasonably certain. So both that Petro virtual tour and that um, that pa stadium panorama were done using using that Panatour software. So. Um, when I looked for other ones, it seemed like I kept coming back to this one as far as a, a virtual tour or a, um, options for that. So we already did this piece. It was creating the aura in Erasma. And so that's kind of the main things I had to show. Yes? Jill, or it, actually anybody, have, has anyone seen interest from their communication folks or their PR folks? about already doing this as being a resource that we can tap folks so that we don't have to buy everything and don't have to learn it all. We can just make supply the mm -hmm. whatever they need, the pictures, the content, the location, and they come out and help us. If you have a like this, to be a lot of athletics and museums on campuses where these are happening. So, um, you know, North Carolina State is not part of us yet, but we'll be calling you. <laughs> <laughs> no, That's call, your future job. Yeah, you call Alan and you call <laughs> I'm just saying I've seen some cool things and wanted to show them. Um, so the, the auras are about as far as I've gotten. <laughs> I think it would help with that piece of it where you really feel like you need to be in the field or need to be right there. You know, that's what's missing from a lot of online courses. I hadn't even thought of that soccer. That's a great idea. I yeah. question. Now this is, I mean, this is a new into the low tech El guys, but look at the up scenario. We would like to be able to, to have on our uh, carcass composting field day. Okay? There are some issues with that. First of all, biosecurity thing. I'd like to show, uh, well, I'd like to show a, a slime compost that was not an environmental slime property. So I would ask, can you do it online, keep it private, so that not just anybody can get it, and you're not going to report anything because you want the farmer to be confident that nobody's ever going to see it again, or if you've shown that day, but have a serious how would you set this up? Hardware, software, all that kind of thing. Uh, having some, some linear presentations first to introduce material, but then have somebody on site, on the farm, to be able to, to show the various practices, but have it interactive so that the audience, right. which is probably a very small member, could say, show me that thermometer thing, or show me okay. taking the carcass again. Then never. You don't ask for much, do you? No. <laughs> I, I would and think you could set up and get your extension people right. to help you right. the problem what, or yeah. one-off. Yeah, that's the key. The, <laughs> the, the online, the yeah. technology exists to do that from the classroom. Now, you can do that and, and don't ask me exactly how or the technology, but it seems like we can't do that. Well, we've been doing that for a while. Okay. Yeah, so it seems like that while, yeah. so it seems like yeah, we should be close to be able to do that. Right. You know, yeah, a lot of your yeah. online course software will have ways where you may need a passcode <coughs> to get into it. So if you were to be delivering all the content through that, that shell, they would need the registration key or they would need to um, 
know, have that information or to get into the CS. Yeah. Even just good old, uh, uh, I think if you were to do YouTube Live, it wouldn't be on a smartphone, but if you had a computer or webcam sitting there, I think YouTube Live you can password protect a video too. So you could do that. Um, but yeah, there'd definitely be ways to have that interactive piece, to have the, um, the protection. You know, you just, I don't think you're going to find it in one place. You're going to need to put a lot of pieces together. So cool, I'm gonna see all kinds of great virtual tours next to Waste to Earth. <laughs> I'm, I'm excited about that. Any other questions or ideas? I'd love to hear what you guys might want to do with these. Oh, sorry. <laughs> do you have, does anybody have um, applications or ideas for applications for this classroom setting? Just to say, or a seat software and apps, there's, there's a lot more out there, but as I was just, I was really trying to look at extension and, and university type people like us who are, have similar missions and, and where are they beginning to dip their feet into this and play and so those were the things that all kind of came to the top at that point. So hopefully that gives you some ideas, like you, clearly you can see I'm a long ways from an expert in this, but I, I was just excited by the possibilities and wanted to show some of them. So. Hopefully that was useful. I think we're at the end of our hour, so if you need to get to another session. Yep. Oh, and I was going to a question, a quick comment. So the University of Nebraska one, it is super fancy, and they have all this technology, but there is an app that the 3D that you use to be able to take a photo of this like that. So you can't necessarily add those features, but if you're just trying to get a picture that people can interact with, download the app for free. What app is it? Yeah. <laughs> but you can Google it. It's a good, I think it's a Google app. And so basically what you do is you hold your camera up and there's an orange circle in the middle. And so you like leave it there and then the orange circle like disappears and you look up and you have to like align the orange circle and circle and you just like keep moving it around. And then it stitches them all together. Like yeah, Adobe. I know I was so bummed when Microsoft shut down PhotoSynth because that was, it kind of would stitch a lot of that for you, but these apps are better. But, yeah. Oh. Hi, Michelle. Oh, she probably can't hear me. So, yeah. Oh, no. 
Hi, Michelle. Hey, Jill. How are you? We're just getting uh, getting ready to. We're finishing up the last workshop, and we'll start in just a minute or two, if that's all right. Cool, that's fine. All right. All right. So those of you that want to see the smartphone and live streaming, I have a real expert on this one, <laughs> as you can hear, and we'll uh, head out. So thanks, Jill. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, thank you.